Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Annie Black. I am the Director of Programs and Volunteers at the Dallas Holocaust and Human Rights Museum. Thank you again for joining us for tonight's History Highlights program, Rwanda Through the Ten Stages of Genocide. I'd like to start tonight by thanking our community partners for this program, Big Brothers Big Sisters Lone Star, Congregation to Fair at Israel, Dallas Dinner Table, Human Rights Campaign Dallas-Fort Worth, Legacy Senior Communities, Southwest Jewish Congress, Temple Shalom, and the Texas Holocaust Genocide and Anti-Semitism Advisory Commission. Thank you so much for your support of the museum and our programs. I'd also like to welcome our museum members, board members, and volunteers who are joining us this evening. We couldn't put on programs like tonight's or fulfill our mission without your support. We will leave time uh, for questions at, the, at tonight, the end of tonight's program. Please use the Q&A button located at the bottom of your screen to type out and submit your questions. You can do that at any point during the program. It is now my pleasure to turn things over to our presenter tonight, Dr. Charlotte DeCoster, the museum's Ackerman Family Director of Education. Thank you, Annie, and welcome everyone. Um, my name is Dr. Charlotte DeCoster, and I um, am uh, going to talk tonight about the Rwanda genocide uh, against the Tutsis uh, in relation to the 10 stages of genocide. And as Annie mentioned, um, you are welcome to post questions during the session. If I see some of them pop up, I might and answer some of them as well as we go through. Before we get started, I did want to stress some key points as we go through this presentation. It's first of all that this is not a chronological overview of the Rwanda genocide against the Tutsis um, or a detailed review of the different aspects of the genocide. Uh, instead, I am going to try to use the 10 stages of genocide, which I'll introduce in just a moment, uh, to highlight some of the elements of the process of the Rwanda genocide. And I think it is a very enlightening way to look at this particular genocide um, as it brings up elements that we usually don't consider in a genocide that is usually known as one of the shortest genocides on record with a very high uh, murder toll. What I also wanted to uh, make sure is that we are not just going to look at um, the, uh, the few hundred days in 94, but that we will rather look today at the long history of the Rwanda genocide against the Tutsis, really taking the opportunity to see how that process came to be and not just the face of extermination or what is often legally considered as genocide. Finally, um, I do want to always highlight that um, there is no avoiding uh, graphic information, graphic conversations when talking about genocide. Um, I will have some graphic images in this presentation and uh, questions or discussions might arise about um, extreme violence, of course, murder and potential sexual violence as well. Uh, so if we have anybody in the audience that might be sensitive to these issues, I do not recommend this presentation for them. I wanted to start first with an introduction to the 10 stages of genocide. As a major feature to New York Museum, we have a whole gallery dedicated to the 10 stages of genocide in our human rights wing. The model was created, developed by Dr. Gregory Stanton in the 1990s as a method to create genocide awareness and a better understanding of what the process of genocide is. Rather than in the genocide convention, looking just at the legal aspect of genocide and defining the moment of uh, mass murder, the 10 stages of genocide break down the full process of genocide into 10 stages or 10 markers. These 10 stages, as you can see listed here, uh, classification, symbolization, discrimination, dehumanization, organization, polarization, preparation, persecution, extermination, and denial together form the process of genocide. It is these 10 markers that we see in every genocide. However unique or different a genocide might be, 
these 10 markers always appear. What is important about the 10 stages of genocide and an understanding of the process of genocide is that it never happens the same way. Although these 10 markers or these 10 stages always occur, they never occur in the same way. This is not a linear process, meaning these stages don't happen in chronological order from classification to denial, but rather come as ebb and flows, building upon each other and sometimes joining together. For example, I call this frequently in our dose and training, the Texas two-step, that many of these stages appear hand in hand. Usually earlier on, we see the early stages appearing such as classification and symbolization but they don't necessarily um, disappear as other stages start entering the process. We usually see them lurking in the background. And I think that will be clear when we look today at the Rwanda genocide against the Tutsis, that classification remained throughout. And if on it, build block by build block, these other stages were built uh, into it. And already very early on within the process, we see denial appearing that it doesn't have to wait till the sta uh, stage of extermination for it to appear. This makes the process of genocide very complex. Um, and, but it also gives, the 10 stages also gives us an understanding to break down this very complex process. And it is for that reason that I'm using the 10 stages tonight to look at the Rwanda genocide, to just give a different perspective, a different light at the facts of the genocide. Again, if there's any questions as we go through, or if you would like me to further explain something, you're always welcome to use the Q&A button uh, to ask those questions and I can see them pop up. As I mentioned earlier, I will be looking at what we call the long history or the long time, uh, the long timeline of the Rwanda genocide against the Tutsis. Um, usually when we look at the Rwanda genocide, we look at the start of April um, 6th when um, the president's plane is um, rocketed down and this uh, apparent assassination attempt or marked to kick off what is legally considered under uh, the United Nations um, Genocide Convention as uh, genocide. In the 10 stages of genocide, we call this phase the actual extermination. But it is really important to understand that at this point, the genocide has already been, the process of genocide has already been going on for a few decades. And we rarely look outside of those parameters of those 100 days in 94 from April and May into June. Um, and we rarely look at the full process just at this stage of extermination. And I think because of that, we lose a lot of the main points of awareness, of recognition that prevention could have been possible with the Rwanda genocide as well. So this is why it's important to look at this longer timeline, starting really already um, in the 19th century with the colonization of the territory, um, Rwanda, Urundi. Um, what one day would become the country of Rwanda, originally colonized by Germany and parts of Central Africa colonized by Germany and later had taken over uh, and merged with some of the other Belgian colonies. It is during this time that a lot of the process or the beginning blocks of the concepts or the elements that will lead uh, to genocide um, will find its roots. And therefore, it's really important to look at that colonization period of Central Africa um, to bring some of that understanding. We'll look at that in a little bit as well. Uh, one big marker, and we'll talk about that, is the implementation of the Rwanda ID card system, li listing what the Belgians uh, define as the different racial groups or different ethnic groups within Rwanda further driving a wedge uh, between the different groupings. Um, and then of course, moving out of colonization, um, the social revolution, the Hutu so uh, social revolution starting uh, in the late 1950s, leading to Rwanda's independence from Belgium in 1962. With that, we see um, the rise of Hutu nationalism and some Hutu extremism as well 
which is going to lead to many Tutsis fleeing and the first discrimination and persecution of Tutsis starting. Uh, we see this really uh, big implementation of that happening, uh, leading to persecution and, and the start of the murder of Tutsis in 1963, when a small um, Tutsi um, rebellion um, army invades back into Rwanda. And the reprisals of these are immense. Uh, approximately 10,000 Tutsis is estimated to be in murdered um, during this time period. Uh, many of them innocent civilians, not related to any military incursions uh, by outside um, refugees in neighboring countries. And from that, we do get an overturn of fre frequent purges in 1967. We have a second anti-Tutsi pur purge happening in Rwanda with a systematic implementation of discrimination throughout as well. In 1973, the military coup, which uh, will become um, by Javier Ramana, who will become the president of Rwanda. And with that, we get really the systemization of that discrimination, um, leading in all levels from government to social life, school life, business life, economic life that we will see. And, um, uh, in the early 90s, we see a uh, reforming of Tutsis who have fled Rwanda, uh, creating militias and armies outside. Uh, one of them will be led by General Kagani, uh, which will become the Rwanda Patriotic Front. Um, and they will initiate again a new civil war with incursions into Rwanda. Um, this fighting will eventually lead to the UN stepping in with the Arusha Accords and a very, very temporary uh, peace agreement, allowing Tutsis also into the government in Rwanda. Um, that will all fall apart um, by, 1990, by April of 94, when the genocide officially uh, kicks off. Um, and so I want to give this whole narrative does not talk about the actual space of extermination yet in that stage, which is usually the stage that we look at. So I wanted to start with this timeline before because it is really important to understand this when we actually use the 10 stages to look at this genocide because you'll see a lot of these points coming back. Um, and it just gives us a better understanding how the 10 stages as an awareness model work as well, because if we could have recognized those earlier stages of classification, symbolization, <clears throat> discrimination happening within Rwanda society, there might have been different ways that we could have prevented something like the Rwanda genocide against the Tutsis. And it's a guiding tool for us today to recognize, to look around as well, and not wait until that phase of extermination to step in. So I'm going to start, I'm going to highlight each one of the stages and go through the process um, of um, genocide through the lens. Um, I've paired each one of these uh, stages with an example from this uh, long timeline of the Rwanda genocide uh, and, and try to pair this with images. And I, when I say I try to pair this with images, I want to be clear about that is that not always are images available. Um, and what you'll also see in this, uh, as we go through these 10 stages, is that you're gonna see some images repeat. Um, that is because several instances or several examples are examples of multiple stages. And, they, and I tried to find kind of the best, clearest example uh, for them. And um, so that we can kind of fully go around that process, but also understand that a lot of these stages overlap and build up on each other. And again, as we go, as I go through these images, if you have any questions, please uh, feel free um, to put them in the Q&A as well. So the first stage is classification. Classifications are when all cultures have categories to distinguish which, uh, people into us versus them. In genocide, victims are targeted because of their national, ethnic, racial, or religious identities. Other classifications such as gender, uh, uh, sexual classifications, political, economic, or social identities may also make um, group 
uh, make a group a target. <coughs> I apologize. Um, classification does not necessarily need to lead to genocide, but without it, uh, genocide is impossible. So let me stress that last sentence there is that this stage appears always in the process of genocide, but it frequently appears in society and does not need to lead to genocide. It is when this classification is used for hatred and becomes part of the process of genocide that we need to become aware of it. And so um, I, I brought some um, elements in here um, to kind of um, show that classification. Um, the first one is uh, during colonization and especially during Belgium colonization is how uh, this classification was uh, strengthened uh, by Belgian colonizers, recognizing that there were two groups, not understanding the differences or the com commonalities between these groups and therefore putting their own impressions on it. What they figured is this group and is the other group, um, mainly being the Tutsis and the Hutus. And with that distinction, really placing on that uh, European notions of division and classification on that. And realizing that one group is a smaller group than the other and taking advantage of that, of putting that group in a more leadership position is enhancing those um, elements for it to take advantage in a sense of a European colonizing structure. Um, basically reinforcing the us versus them that you are different, you are better, you are um, uh, should be preferred over others, um, you have a different status and, and you are the other. Uh, however you might see that correlation, um, that definitely was reinforced that there was a difference, that there was a Tutsi and a Hutu. Here you can see um, an image right here of uh, Belgian King Baudouin meeting with King Mutara III with Ruda Riga. I apologize for my pronunciation. Um, who uh, was a Tutsi king who worked closely with the Belgian government um, and um, assisted King Baudouin and the Belgian government in reshaping Rwanda uh, in those Euro towards those European values, but also towards the Catholic Church's values, um, even more reinforcing that classification as well. And so that division that us versus them although not violent, uh, definitely existed there and was part of society by the time we will get to um, Rwandan independence in the early 1960s. And that really brings me to the picture before that once uh, Rwanda independence is created, there is already a distinction of us versus them, of Hutus versus Tutsis. And, and the Hutus, um, already from the beginning, when the declaration, uh, when the human, <clears throat> when the declaration of independence is made, with that becomes comes the Bahutu Manifesto, uh, and that is spelled B-A-H-U-T-U Manifesto, uh, which was written in 1957 and uh, really declared already the Tutsi as the enemy, as different, and as a danger to uh, the Hutu. And so it reinforced that classification now much more in a um, hateful way. Uh, and this is where we can really start recognizing that this distinction has made, and this is a hateful distinction, this us versus them uh, that has been created there. And you can see a um, photo here of um, the uh, signing of some of the Parma Hutu leaders, um, the Hutu leadership, um, in uh, the early 1960s of the Rwanda independence. So it is really important to understand is again, classification can come from very different ways. In this case, uh, a classification this us versus them that probably already existed in Rwanda society before colonizers came there, but definitely was deepened and strengthened under colonization. So by the time we get to independence, it is a clear us versus them, um, reinforced by a manifesto um, that is widely spread, that is that many are aware of, that 
um, there is a distinction between Tutsis and Hutus and that the majority of the population Hutu should not be okay with the Tutsi, that they are different, that they are the enemy, um, they are the supporters of co colonialism um, and that they are a threat um, to uh, the Hutu population. And so um, from uh, colonization, uh, so, sorry, from classification, we see very quickly with that comes symbolization. And symbolization is when perpetrators use symbols to identify and target groups of people. Symbols include names, uh, physical signs as well. Symbols are used in the process of genocide to depersonalize members of a group. And that is really important, right? Is the these symbols are again used for hateful purposes. Frequently they are self-imposed, uh, meaning that they are a distinctive dress, a language, a sacred emblem, something about the victim group that they already carry on them or that is already part of their identity. Other symbols can be imposed. Um, they are a given in a sense by the perpetrator group, making it easier to identify them as the enemy, right? Or it is a mark that is given by somebody else, by a group that the perpetrator group keeps in this case. Um, as symbolization as well. So again, I want to kind of show how these stages of classification and symbolization really overlap. This is why I brought and, and continue, right? This symbolization, as I said, uh, is a definition that says, says, right, a lot of it can be physical signs too. And this drawing um, uh, right here of Tutsi Hutu Twa, if you Google Hutu versus Tutsi or Hutu Tutsi, you're probably going to see this drawing. Um, it is that kind of token drawing that still is used to display who is a Hutu and a Tutsi. And, and it's not accurate, by the way. It's, it's, it's very much reinforcing um, that classification um, set during colonization uh, that is in, was instilled there of these different groups and this is what they look like and bring into that European values. So what you can see here is that the Tutsi here is symbolically defined as taller, fairer skinned, narrower nose, all those European values, right, put in place during colonization. On the, uh, in the middle there, you have the Hutu who is a little shorter, stockier build, wider nose, again, not those strong European features. Now, in reality, um, some Tutsis look like could fit into the Hutu category of this drawing. Some Hutu could fit in the Tutsi category. Um, Tutsi and Hutu can uh, intermarry and have children and be, and we have, um, we're gonna see during the Rwanda genocide, we are gonna have children that identify in different ways. Um, and, you know, so these, these buckets that are created through classification and if symbolization of exterior appearances fit with that really can create and, and, and really drive us down that process of genocide even further. And there are these clear markers, right, that we are now uh, using physical features to symbolize that classification that is already in place. And it is interesting that still that is used today. I actually, uh, when I Googled it, I saw somebody had a presentation on the Rwanda genocide and used this particular image to explain the difference between Hutu and Tutsi. And so that symbolization today is still driven through even though we teach about the Rwanda genocide um, with that. So that way, of course, this is a, is a self-imposed physical sign, right, that is used for symbolization, really somebody's outward appearance. Um, the other symbolization during the Rwanda genocide is a very clear one. It's probably one of the, the most uh, recognized elements of the Rwanda genocide against the Tutsis, but it is also a symbol. This, this, this stage is also didn't start in 94. The stage started much earlier, as I mentioned, during colonization as well, before Rwanda's um, independence, the Belgium government instituted the ID cards. And the Belgium myself, I'm very familiar with the concept of Belgium ID cards there. As you can see on this image right here, this very slight little paper. Um, on one side, it has your date of birth, your name, your profession on it. Um, and um, 
and maybe where you're born as well. And on the other side, you can kind of do some record keeping um, on it as well. Sometimes it has additional information, marriages on there. What is particular about this ID card that the Belgians implement is that, as you can see on there, it has different and ethnic groups on there. You can see that top line, ethnic, on there, and for in French, ethnicity. Um, and you can see uh, there's four there, um, and three of them are marked out, and Tutsi is left over. So this person is now symbolized as marked as Tutsi. Now, during the stage of extermination, this symbolization is definitely going to be used. It also in the latter stages, so the symbolization is implemented in the sense, in this case, by the colonizers, but it is it is reinforced again or once um, the Hutu government uh, is in power and once they become the majority party in the Rwanda government, and once the um, Rwanda genocide, the actual phase of extermination is implemented, the ID cards are going to be the main tool, the symbol is going to be the main tool of how Tutsis are going to be located and found besides word of mouth, right? If your neighbor, I know that you're Tutsi. And, uh, but this became one of the main tools, uh, making it very dangerous, right? Symbolization is a very necessary step within the process of genocide. Um, again, I'm gonna move on to our next stage unless there's any questions. Just so we're only on stage one, we can make it to all of them. So the next stage is discrimination. And um, here we go, I, I, this is the next level, right? In the beginning, I said a lot of times you see these two stages appearing together, classification and symbolization. And you can kind of already see how colonization, those two stages definitely started forming and, and were strengthened once Rwanda came to its independence. Then the stage of discrimination, right? And this is really important. Um, it starts very early on in the process usually too. And it is during this time that the dominant group, in the case of the Rwanda genocide against the Tutsis, it's gonna be the Hutu uh, government, the majority of the Hutu population is going to use laws, but also custom. That is really important to understand social pressures and political power to deny the rights of the weaker group or the minority group. Um, powerless groups are not granted full citizen, full civil rights, voting rights, or even citizenship, meaning they are pushed out as well. This is frequently during, we, uh, um, during genocide, the process of genocide that we see mass refugee uh, situations happening as well. Now I wanted to show you um, two examples here of um, discrimination, how law and custom is basically removing the civil rights, civil rights of um, and and the basic rights of the Tutsis during the Rwanda genocide against um, the Tutsis. Um, the first image is the image on the right, which is um, uh, actually a group of Tutsis in the Kalonga Refugee Center in the Kivu pro province in the Congo. Um, approximately 150,000 Rwandans fled in the early 1960s once um, the Hutu government established itself and Rwanda got itself in the, got its independence. Oh, about 150,000 Rwandans fled, mainly Tutsis fled Rwanda. And these are some of these refugees that we can see um, actually here um, in photos of this refugee uh, camp center um, at this point. Uh, and this is a photo of the 1960s. This is not the 90s yet. Uh, but uh, Tutsis fleet on mass because there was retaliations, but also they, uh, they lost their jobs. Um, their children uh, were not safe at schools. Um, they were uh, not just fleeing for their lives, but for basic necessities as well, uh, because those rights were being removed. And that systematically built up. Um, to show you to the extent is um, to the left of that, that is actually an image, uh, part of an exhibit at the Gigali Genocide Memorial uh, of the Hutu Ten Commandments, which uh, were published in the 1990s, in December of 1990 in Kangura, one of the leading, uh, what is today considered more extremist Hutu uh, 
um, propaganda newspapers. And um, these uh, Hutu Ten Commandments, um, they clearly state you should not get a, a, a Tutsi wife, you should not lay with a Tutsi wife, you should not have a Tutsi secretary, your children should not go to school with Tutsis. Um, very systematically, basically uh, making it clear to Hutus, these are the social norms, you should not intermingle with them. Um, you should not um, set those pressures. This is not socially accepted. Uh, Tutsis do not have those rights. Uh, and frequently we um, hear um, um, survivors from the Rwanda genocide talk about uh, when they were young children, being in the class in the late 80s and the 90s and um, being called out in the classroom for being Tutsi, um, required to stand up, to go sit in the back corner, um, to not be allowed to come to school or not have recess, um, Tutsis being fired, being excluded from government. Um, the Arusha courts, of course, are going to change that in 93, but being excluded from government itself. And so systematically removing those um, basic rights. Uh, and that makes it very hard for the victim group to fight back. And so that um, is, is uh, a really key stage within the process of genocide, but still a stage, right? This, 1961 is still a point where we can see this happening and step in. Again, if there's any questions, please feel free to put them in the Q&A. Dehumanization. Um, dehumanization, again, um, when you hear it, you know what it is, but really looking at it as a stage, it is when the, uh, the group in power denies the humanity of the other group, of the victim group, right? Members are equated to insects, animals, diseases, invaders, criminals, terrorists, the enemy, uh, traitors, um, or they're listed as subhuman as well. Um, they, they're basically overcoming the revulsion for murder, right? That's why this stage is so necessary. Um, it does precede always that stage, usually of persecution and um, extermination, is because it allows uh, everybody in the society to become used to it that this is okay. This person uh, should not be here, anyways. It's okay to murder them. They're not really human or they're subhuman in a way. And during the Rwanda genocide, we are going to hear that word right throughout the process from the 1960s. Tutsis are the enemy, they are traitors. Um, even if you are a moderate Hutu and you are aligning yourself, you become part of that group. You are a traitor as well to your people. You uh, might as well be it. Um, and then um, animal-like, right? They are cockroaches. Um, they don't, um, they, you know, should you be just stepped it on and pushed, right? That's what you do with a cockroach. So I put actually, this is from the gender, uh, Genocide Archive of Rwanda. This is actually um, a transcript here. Um, from May 16, 94, so just a little bit before the actual official, you know, legal um, genocide kicks off on April 6. So just a few weeks before that, on May 16, 94, um, this is a transcript from a broadcast on Radio Television Mil Milcolin, uh, one of the big propaganda uh, radio stations, which was widely listened to in Rwanda. Um, and it is um, an interview, or they're about to interview uh, this claimed um, young man who has left the RPF, the Rwanda Patriotic Front, um, this, this Tutsi uh, militia army that um, um, is part of the civil war in Rwanda. And um, is fighting the Hutu um, army. And um, he, they have pulled out this um, young man and, and, and said, oh, this, this, this young man is part of the RPF. Um, not sure if he actually is. Um, and this is what the RPF does to these, these young, you know, they abuse them, they get them, to, they, these poor children. Um, and um, listen how they continuously refer to them, right? So I'm going to just read a little bit. You will also hear the child, this is this child that they're about to interview, recognizing that they will not win this war. So the child fights for the RPF, although knowing that the RPF is not going to win. And then he has revealed to me, since he used a heavy weapon, 
which made him lose a lot of strength. They put big pieces of wood on him so that the weapon couldn't be heavier than him. So, right, they abused this child. They're, you know, they're child abusers now to the RPF. Um, reinforcing these, these stereotypes. So he shot these pieces of wood being on his shoulder. As a result, he has got wounds on his shoulder. He will tell us a lot of things about the cockroaches, the RPF, right? So he refers to the, to the army as the cockroaches. And anytime in this transcript, uh, in this broadcast, uh, anytime a Tutsi is referred to, they refer to him as uh, him or her as the cockroach or cockroaches when it's the RPF. Listen to his revelations. It is sad. It is sad to hear that the cockroaches uh, take 12 year old, 12 year, 12 year children, young children to the battle and give them this difficult task because they are children, still ignorant and not yet intelligent enough. The child may think that he can pass through the shootings of a fly. They uh, make him pass in fire. And when they shoot, they tell him that nothing bad can happen to him. So um, this is just this propaganda machine continuously feeding um, Tutsis are cockroaches to be stepped on. We need to get rid of them. But they're also, in, in this case, uh, child abusers, right? This is what you do to a child abuser. You get rid of them. You hurt them. It's okay to invoke pain in them. So it's that dehumanization. And I want to make clear of that. Uh, I wanted to stress this because oftentimes when we think of the stage of dehumanization, we think um, of the use of cockroaches, but it goes beyond that, right? Is especially this enemy connection to it as well. So uh, even with um, Hutu, um, who um, were moderates, who might align themselves or show sympathy um, to Tutsis, they fell under this stage of dehumanization as well. Actually, here is an image of a um, um, Hutu social democrat um, who was not part of the leading, would, be, would become the leading extremist Hutu par party uh, in Rwanda. Um, his name is uh, Mark Ruganera, um, and he's depicted here as a rat, right? He's this traitor, that rat-like. So here that dehumanization too is um, um, quite frequently during the Rwanda genocide. Uh, moderate Hutus or Hutus who aligned themselves with Tutsis were murdered um, they fell, right, it's that us versus them, they fell in that bracket as well. And we'll talk about polarization here in just a second. But it just shows, again, how all of these stages overlap um, with that as well. Um, by the way, that, um, let me check again, that uh, poster of Marga uh, Ruganera, um, I believe, is from a 91 publication of um, Kangura, that is actually from um, Kangura as well, that um, uh, uh, news pamphlet, basically. Okay, stage of organization. Now we're really get to it. This is, you know, the stage of organization is usually when the world starts becoming a little bit more aware and starts paying attention when um, this stage comes into it. It's also a key stage because the structure of the genocide is now slowly being set, right? We go from these broader concepts to actually the putting in place of the building blocks of what will be the mass murder. The organization is usually um, organized by the lead perpetrator or by the state. Governments use militias to provide deniability, right? And they create some kind of entity so that the state itself, the leaders are not blamed, but another group is blamed. Sometimes the organization is informal, which we're going to see in this case. Sometimes bureaucracies are used to manage mass organizations. Sometimes there are uh, secret police or militias created. Uh, it is during this stage that these militias, these organizations start to spy, do arrests, um, start practicing and training. Uh, so we see a lot of training um, uh, and this, this organization of these militias who will eventually implement the murder. Right, uh, creating that deniability uh, for the for the leaders themselves because they are not going to do the dirty work. Now, during the Rwanda genocide, there is different organizations that are going to be created um, that will fulfill this role. We usually have this vision of, um, you know, it's this murder that is done by everybody. Um, every, you know, every Hutu just came out and started murdering the Tutsis, but it was actually really organized, and this infrastructure started quite a bit before the actual, before we get to 94. One of the key markers that I always want to show for this stage of organization is the creation of the interwangi. And this is a Hutu 
paramilitary, basically a militia uh, for that uh, party that is created. It is for the Democratic Republic of, um, it was both uh, um, active in the Democratic Republic of Congo and Uganda as well. Uh, but the Interwami was formed in 1990 as the youth wing, the youth group, think about that, right? As the youth militia uh, for the National Republican Movement for Democracy and Development. Uh, for the then uh, ruling party in Rwanda, uh, and enjoyed extreme backing, extreme support from extremist Hutus who wanted to eliminate any Tutsi who are implementing that plan for genocide. Um, these, the Interwami was trained. It has an official flag. You can see the flag right here. Um, and by the way, some um, still in Central Africa, sometimes that uh, flag is still used today. Um, and, and you can see some of those training photos right here, endless drills, um, preparing them how to put up roadblocks, how to hold machete, how to kill with machete, uh, how to hold guns. Uh, and you can see on these photos here, these are young men that are being trained as basically a militia to prepare for this. Um, and, um, and that is um, a, that is that stage of organization, right? And we quite frequently see that in many different ways, from very informal to more structured and formalist here, as we see with the Indrawami. Polarization. Now we get that distinction, right? The, the split um, between it is uh, when society is really being divided in opposing groups. Uh, groups are based on political opinions, religious beliefs, ethnic differences, but it's really when the during the stage that the propaganda machine goes in overdrive, really hateful propaganda, a loss um, forbidding interaction between the groups, right? Here in Rwanda, that is going to be uh, Tutsis uh, and moderate Tutsis forbidding that interaction, right? It is that really where we start building that us versus them. Um, you can either choose to be with the Hutu or you can be a traitor. Um, it eliminates the ability for the moderates to speak up. It is really the attempt to silence them, to make sure that they understand that that is not part of society's concept. Of course, Kangura, uh, you can see it right here. I want to, it is the, the main leader in here. But, um, and this is just another uh, one of the front covers of Kangura, um, um, established in 1990 and edited uh, and directed by Hassan uh, Ngeze, uh, it, it becomes the, the leading newspaper, widely dis distributed. Eventually, uh, Radio Milkolin is going to join that as well. And not only do we have this, this newspaper being published, but also this uh, um, um, radio station continuously broadcasting that dehumanization that we uh, that stage, right, as interconnecting with that, but also um, these social laws that are not acceptable anymore. And this is where we see that stage of discrimination and, and polarization overlapping, right? I have, again, these Hutu Ten Commandments, they are published in Kangura, continuously stressing again to moderate Hutus, hey, uh, your children should not play with Tutsis. Again, you should not have a secretary. This is not allowed. So really creating that divide within society, right? And, and pushing those social uh, structures that this is unacceptable uh, for these two to intermingle. You should not marry. Um, that is, you know, against the Hutu um, uh, people. If you, if you marry a Tutsi, all of those social pressures as well. I and mean, then continuously on radio as well. This is how you should treat a Tutsi. This is how you should regard them. They should not come in your schools. They should not come in your business. You should not even be doing business with them. Reinforcing this over and over and over again. Then preparation, right? Preparation, I call this really the planning stage. This is where we put the plan together, where we start drafting it. And this is where it gets really hard during genocide. Is even if we look back on um, a genocide like the Rwanda um, genocide against the Tutsis, because these perpetrators don't want this plan to be out there, right? This plan is usually in, in the back. We don't know usually what the exact plan is. And we can see that in most genocides. But um, the leaders do usually draft in different ways some kind of plan for the murder. Um, this can include additional training of militias, um, spreading of lies, the, another increased level of propaganda, um, and really starting to disguise the genocide 
as self-defense. That's really what we start seeing during this place as the plans start rolling out. Um, and we really see that, right? With the civil war between um, the RPF, uh, the Tutsi militia army, and uh, the Rwanda army, these two class, uh, these the civil war going on, that we see a, a, an, an increase, right, um, of this this us versus them. If we don't go kill them now, they will kill us. And by the way, that already existed. And we we see this right with with some of those previous. But we'll look at persecution in a little bit. Um, these tensions have come already, right? This kind of planning, this us versus them, it has occurred before. But by the time we come to the 90s, it is definitely in place. And now we see the real formation, right? How do we know that that happened? Um, I always point to the famous United Nations uh, facts sent by General Dallaire. Um, and this is actually the, uh, the, the top image that you see here is as a top picture of um, that uh, fax that he sent to headquarters in the United Nations saying, I have this person who has come to me that is very familiar with uh, parts of the government. Um, and, and this person is telling me that a plan is in place. He has the plan here, lines out the plan, what is going to happen, how this is going to happen, and um, what should I do? Um, so in, in this case, we do that, know that there's a plan there. We know that um, General Delaire, representing the United Nations in Rwanda, is aware of this plan too. He has somebody there that literally has come and told that plan. Uh, and so um, in this case, we have concrete evidence of a plan being there, how this is put in place, how the radio will be implemented, how death lists will be called out, how they're going to do that. And then, of course, this the need for the fuel, the, the, um, the moment that the strike itself, right, which we now know will be the shooting down, the rocketing down of the president of Rwanda and Burundi um, who are having peace meetings um, and their plane being shot down. And that's what you can see here, that image as well. So um, that is really important to understand is this that having that plan in place that happens during that stage of preparation and that forcing through to make sure when the plan is enacted that those who you consider part of your group of the perpetrator group that you understand that this is a necessary right at this point there is no turning back uh, for those who connect with the perpetrator group and it is during this time as well and then again as I said. We can go very early, early on back in this long history, right? To see these stages happening. It's a stage of persecution. This is the stage right before extermination. Um, it is when victims are identified, are separated out by identity groups. We are going to see death lists drawn up. Um, uh, sometimes uh, groups are segregated out. Um, um, in this case, um, you know, in Rwanda, you see the image right here is we have immense refugee camps, right? Um, and refugees across the borders. And so anytime those refugees come back in, they're an easy mark, right? They're segmented, they're in this, in this sense already pushed out. We see victim abuses, we see murder, we see torture, forced displacement. Again, refugees, right, they're pushing out. And massacres. I call this the testing phase. And um, that's what persecution is. It is doing these um, big human rights abuses and massacres, but not big enough that it falls under the legal definition of full intent to wipe out a whole group of people. That is not what we consider the phase of extermination yet. And so in the Rwanda genocide, I actually put um, back an image here uh, from 1961. Again, that remember that image I showed you way earlier uh, about refugees fleeing? Again, um, a totally different stage, but again, this forced displacement, ref creating a refugee crisis is part, is a really key mark of multiple stages, but in the process of genocide. But in the image on top, and I, uh, um, I, I, this is why I gave the warning earlier, um, is an image of December of 1963. Um, in, in 1963, um, a group of what were considered Tutsi rebels, uh, refugees who had fled, um, uh, kind of joined together, not very large, 
a few hundred of them joined together to uh, create an incursion back into Rwanda with the hope of taking over the government and doing some kind of coup. And this was a failed invasion, but it unleashed an immense persecution against the Tutsis. And, you know, all of these stages had been building. And at that point, we do see this first kind of action popping out, right? Um, is the, this uh, first massacre, in a sense, that we oftentimes overlook. And uh, approximately about, um, um, you know, uh, 10,000 Tutsis uh, are murdered in this because we see in return these retaliation, not on the military incursion, but instead on Tutsi civilians who are just living in Rwanda who have nothing to do with this process. Uh, the, the invasion or anything. Um, so we see already um, the military parts of the government go out and call uh, for them in several of the uh, provinces of Rwanda. The biggest um, um, murders happening in uh, Bugesera, uh, one of the provinces there. Um, so, um, so these massacres of 500 here, 800 here, together in December of 1963 are that clear indicator. And the world, in a sense, looks on, right? That's what they're testing. And so then it sits back, and in the 80s, we'll, we'll have some more massacres, too, and we'll sit back. And it's not until 94, when the full plan now is in place, right, that we get to the actual stage of um, extermination. We're now, we're talking about hundreds of thousands being murdered. Extermination, this space is legally considered genocide. This is where the genocide convention kicks in. So technically nothing up until this point that we've discussed falls under the definition of genocide. And that's the problem in a sense with the genocide convention is that we overlook all of that. We have to really wait to those hundred days in 94 to recognize Rwanda as a genocide. Uh, instead, if we look at the process of the 10 stages and look at this long history, we get a very different perspective. And it makes a lot more sense if we're working towards concept of genocide awareness. So um, this stage, officially in the 10 stages, is also still labeled extermination because the perpetrators do not see their victim as human anymore. It is a necessary uh, good for the community to wipe out the victims. Uh, we see mutilations of bodies. Uh, sexual violence, rape of women. Uh, this happens um, to most uh, genocides and, and very uh, high uh, uh, numbers of sexual violence during the Rwanda genocide, mutilation of bodies. Um, they destroy uh, victims' cultural heritage um, and, and religious institutions as well, quite frequently. And it's sponsored by the state, but of course, it's usually those militias that are going to implement it, right? So we're going to see the inter-army um, co become very actively involved in that. And I'm not going to go into this because um, there's so much documentation out there. Um, you can uh, search the Kigali Genocide Memorial. You can look on the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. The United Nations even has a full online exhibit on the Rwanda genocide that then really narrates what happens from, you know, that key day on April 6th when the president's plane is shot down um, to the Interlami and uh, the FAR, the Rwanda army, setting up roadblocks and starting this door-to-door -door campaign to murder Tutsis. Um, then the RPF launching its counter-offensive uh, to come to the rescue to the Tutsi population, realizing really well what's going to happen there. And then, of course, soon follow up with that. Uh, is the withdrawal of the United Nations after um, Belgian soldiers are murdered. And then really by April 28th, seeing the widespread, widespread mass murder ha happening that is gonna occur in to, um, July, uh, considered frequently the more than 100 days of murder um, with hundreds of thousands. Um, most, uh, we uh, still, uh, uh, numbers are not said, but we're probably, uh, for the Rwanda genocide against the Tutsis, looking at close to 1 million victims with that. Which brings us to the last stage. And the last stage, as I told you earlier, usually happens already really early at the beginning. It's denial. And, um, and I uh, brought here the poster from International Criminal Tribunal up here for the Rwandans. But the stage of denial is when perpetrators deny genocide throughout the process. 
right? It is continuously happening. They denied it, uh, it long after two, and it's a good indicator that genocide might occur again. Um, it is also one of the best predictors of future genocides that might still come. And I think that's important to recognize in that long history as well, that denial is a great indicator of what is to come. Perpetrators uh, deny that they committed any uh, crimes and they often blame the victims. The most frequent Rwanda denial is this was part of civil war. These were going to do that to us if we didn't do this. The RPF was invading. This was this wasn't just um, a, this wasn't a genocide. This was part of war, um, and and we were protecting ourselves. We were doing this to protect ourselves, and we can see this already in Kangura using this language. Right, is labeling them as enemies and and anybody else as traitors. And during the international criminal tribunals, um, those who are arrested and put on trial too, that is usually the biggest defense that they put as well, is we were in part of this, this was part of, in a sense, this protection strategy, right? This was part of war and actually more Hutus were hurt in this than Tutsis. Kind of that utter like, you know, calling into question numbers because it's very hard to put numbers, actual uh, numbers on mass murder, right? Because it's on such a large scale. It, um, becomes hard to count. And so uh, finally, um, that denial continues, right? Another uh, group starts picking that up as well. I put uh, Rwanda's Untold Story in there, which is um, a BBC um, documentary that questions actually if uh, what are the true facts. Um, and it um, starts denying on some of these, uh, relying on some of those denial theories. Um, to revision what really happened. And usually when we hear those words, we can see that denial happening. So on a much different scale, an academic scale, getting that support as well, but it all feeds back usually um, to those original deniers as we see with the International Criminal Tribunal. And I am at the end of my time, I have about two minutes left. Um, and I wanted to see if there is any questions. And you can, again, use that Q&A button as well, if you would like to. Um, and one of the questions that came in is, were there any organized efforts from other nations or governments to disrupt the genocide? Um, in a sense, yes and no. Um, uh, there were some efforts on the United Nations part, um, also France and Belgium, but they were very limited still. Also um, China as well, um, some efforts early on to give support um, um, to um, the RPF as well, um, but it was very limited. And when it came to the genocide too, um, it um, was kind of this mass exodus out of Rwanda. Um, the world really dealing with this concept of still what is genocide and how does this impact our nations and um, I think we've made strides forward in in the sense of genocide awareness but um, Rwanda was really a clear indicator how we uh, ignored a lot of warning signs before we actually got to the genocide and then reflected back on this of where we should have stepped in so yes but very very limited Okay, I don't think I see any other questions coming in. So I thank you for joining me. Thank you, Charlotte. Uh, appreciate you as always uh, sharing your evening with us. Thank you everyone for watching tonight. We hope you'll join us for future programs. You can visit our website, dhhrm.org to see what we have coming up. We have an in-person program at the museum next Wednesday, so a week from tonight, um, about coerced labor in Japanese American internment camps. So if that is of interest, we hope you join us. But otherwise, have a great rest of your evening and we will see you next time. Good night.